Donc, je vais parler français un peu, parce que je m'appelle Hannes, j'habite à la Belgique, j'aime courir, j'aime faire la logicielle pour le web, et je travaille pour une entreprise qui s'appelle Fait avec l'amour. Now in English, sorry, I don't... <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So now in English, sorry for the context switching. My name is Hannes. I work for a company called Made with Love. We do web development with PHP and JavaScript. I also like running and I'm Belgian. I live 30 minutes from Brussels, so I speak a little bit of French. Uh, so madewithlove.be is a uh, small company in Belgium. We have about 20 people from Belgium, France, Portugal, Kenya, Brazil, and Canada. So all over the world. Uh, we do what we do with love. So that's why we call Made with Love. I also like running. I went for a run this morning up the hill, the Puy de Chanturgue or something. Who's from around here? Who knows this hill? One people, <laughs> one person. Ah, okay. It's a steep hill, I can tell you. So, on to the technical part of this talk. Package development. Uh, this talk will introduce some beginner tips. So for the people that have never done package development, and then I will switch on to some more intermediate tips, like um, how to uh, use your package in different environments, like your application do, your like your applications do. And then I will um, switch to the third chapter of this talk, which is about package stability. So first chapter, beginner tips, steps. Uh, I started out as a newbie, Fabien Patrassier started out as a newbie, everyone starts out as a newbie one time. So this, are, this is for everyone that has never done package development in his life. Um, there's actually a website that helps you with this, it's called phppackagechecklist.com. It's by Jonathan Reining, uh, the guy who designed the PHP Fig website and the PHP Leak website, so he makes beautiful websites. It's full of hints, I think 15, 16, something like that, uh, and I'm going to go over each one of them. The first one is to pick a name wisely. If you're going to publish a package, it needs to have an, a name. Uh, a name consists of a vendor name and a package name. The vendor name should be something like your company name, or if you're in some kind of organization like the PHP League, then you can use the League vendor name. And then your package name should be something logical. Um, uh, let's say if you're if you're going to make a common mark parser, then the package name can be common mark, for example. Or if you're going to make an OA2 server, just name it OA2 server. That's it. Or PHP CS fixer, not a good example. Uh, once you commit to the name, you cannot rename a package. If you're going to rename a package, then you will essentially publish a new package. It's completely new, and people cannot simply upgrade to it. They have to. Uh, just they have to remove the old package and install the new package. So the second uh, thing to do is to host your source openly. Put it on GitHub, put it on Bitbucket, put it anywhere you like, um, but just make sure that the source is visible for anyone so that other people can contribute. The third thing is to make your code autoloader friendly. It's 2016 now, uh, so we use PSR4 autoloading, so no one has to require any class anymore. If you install a package with Composer, Composer comes with a PSR4 autoloader, so you don't have to do anything anymore. Just configure it in Composer.json and done. Um, Jordi, uh, Jordi actually ran some statistics on all packages that are registered on packages.org, and he found out that 58% of all packages have a auto-loaded uh, folder called source. 5%, I think, yeah, 5% have a lib folder. That's also fine. So thanks, Jordi, for running the statistics and sharing them. There's a li the link is on top of the slides if you want to see the full blog post about it. The next hint is to distribute via Composer. I already mentioned Composer. We all use Composer nowadays, I hope. Um, so, what you should do is, you should register your package on packages.org. If you register it there, then anyone can do composer require your package name, like composer require guzzle http slash guzzle. Uh, use that line of code to 
uh, have install instructions in your readme.md file, do not say add the guzzle http slash guzzle to your composer.json file because then people will need to find out what is the most stable version themselves. If you let the composer do that, the composer will handle that for you. Leave composer.json alone. Next thing is make your package as framework agnostic as possible. Do not or try not to tie into one framework. You want your package to be installed by as many people as possible. So if you're going to make your package only for uh, Symfony or only for Laravel or only for Yi framework, then you're essentially going to leave out all of the other people that use different frameworks or no frameworks. So for example, you're creating an SDK for your awesome uh, API for your awesome company or startup you work for, um, and you're going to make an SDK class. Please do not inject framework-specific stuff into that SDK class. Some frameworks have some kind of register method, and um, what some people do is they uh, take something from the container and inject that straight into the SDK class via the constructor. They have some framework specific config class and they inject it. That's not very good because then no one else can use it except when they install this framework slash config class via Composer. So they're going to be tightly coupled to your framework. Instead, do something like this. Inject an array of options and then get the options from the config object and inject that in the SDK class. That's more convenient for other people and then anyone can use your class and register it in their uh, IOC container. The next thing is follow a coding style. PSR2 has been around for what, two, three years now? So please use that, it's a recommendation, you don't have to, but it actually removes all personal preferences so that everyone is on the same line and no one is arguing or bitching about uh, where to put a space or a tab or whatever. Um, and then you can actually start discussing what the code should do and no longer what the code looks like. So use PSR2. Uh, so you can actually use some tooling like PHP CS Fixer or Code Style Sniffer. Uh, what's it called? PHP CS? Codes. Yeah, Code Style Sniffer. Um, do it also as early as possible. There's nothing more hateful than going to git and doing a git blame and stumbling upon a git commit that changed every every single file in a package uh, just for adjusting the code style. So if you do it as early as possible, then everyone has a good history of what has changed in the most recent commits without stumbling upon a uh, big ass uh, git commit. So if you're not doing PSR2 yet, uh, you can gradually uh, continue with your package development and uh, gradually go towards PSR2 by doing some boy scouting. So every time you are going to change a file, first change the code style, then change the functional changes that you wanted to do. Uh, do it file per file. Don't do it for the entire package at the same time. Also, if someone submits a pull request and the code style hasn't been changed, uh, just ask them politely to first change the code style, then do the functional changes. Next thing is unit testing. I'm not going to ask who does testing uh, because some people are maybe afraid to, sit to, uh, to stay behind or to admit that they don't do testing, so I'm not going to ask that question. Um, you should do testing, um, but not just the happy path. So there's one line through your code where every Thing goes well, that's the happy path. Also test for exceptions or strange behavior. You should have, you should actually test all the paths through your code. This is not um, to ensure, this is not only to ensure people that use your code that your code works. It, it's also insurance in the other way around. So if someone changes your code with a pull request, you can actually say, Oh, this might change. Uh, this this will break this uh, feature. So you should try to avoid that. So it's a, an insurance for both you and for the people that use your code. Next thing you should do is 
write documentation. Doc blocks your code. This is um, documentation inside your code. Uh, it says what your code is supposed to do, what methods are supposed to do, and PHP Storm and other IDEs can then use uh, something called autocompletion. So they know what is returned by a function, and then they can uh, autocomplete whatever you want to type in there. Next thing is use semantic versioning. Your package is going to evolve over, over time. You're going to have different uh, versions of your code. So try to release them, tag it with a release called 1.0.0 or something else, and then follow Semver. If you don't know what Semver is, go to semver.org. Read it twice a year or something, so to refresh your mind a bit. Um, but Semver, uh, if you've been here yesterday for Mathieu uh, Napoli's talk, he talked about this as well. Um, so Semver your code and release as often as possible. If you have small changes in your code, tag a new release. Don't wait for the for 15 new features. Tag a new release with every merged pull request or every feature that gets added. That way, it, it's easier for you to say, oh, well, there's a new release with just a minor bug fix, so I'm going to uh, tag a new bug fix release. If there's a new added feature, then tag a new minor release. If there's something breaking, then tag a new major release. Keep a change log. So your code is going to evolve over time and people need to know what it has been added or changed or fixed. So if you have a change log, a changelog.md file, people can see what has changed without going into your code. There's different types of uh, change logs. There's different formats. This is one. Um, in the top, you can see that there's an unreleased block. This is useful to keep track of what has changed since the last release, since the latest release. Um, so you can actually see that something has changed, um, and then when you tag it, you don't have to add it anymore. Uh, and then you can tag it with a tag version number, or yeah, a new version number, and the date of the release. There's also a um, keepachangelog.com format. Uh, you can view it on keepachangelog.com. I personally use it to fill in release notes. If I have a new release, I don't adjust the changelog.md file, but I write down the uh, release notes in GitHub. That's also pretty useful, but use any any way you want. Uh, at Made We Love, we made a little side project uh, called changehub.io, which uh, looks at every single pull request and gets the changelog from the pull request description. It merges it into the unreleased tab and as soon as you tag a new release, it will populate the release notes with whatever is in this tab. So you can try it out. You can just sign up with GitHub and then use it. Also, you, have, uh, you may have some breaking changes, so you might assist your users to upgrade to the new major versions. So you might add a upgrade.md file, which is also pretty useful. Again, just like with uh, releases, uh, with uh, version numbers, uh, it's useful to release as often as possible. So if you have a new release every now and then, you might want to keep the change log as small as possible, and thus you need to release as often as possible. So you can actually reduce the workload you have when you're uh, doing a new release. Next thing is CI, continuous integration. Uh, there's a ton of different services called, uh, some are called Nitpick CI, Style CI, Travis CI, Scrutinizer CI, and Circle CI. They all went, end with CI. Uh, the top two are for code style. Uh, they actually change, uh, inspect the code style, and then comment on your pull requests or code uh, to say maybe you should move this uh, opening bracket to the previous line or something. Uh, Travis CI and Circle CI are used to run tests. You can also do this on Scrutinizer CI, uh, and I think you can do both testing and uh, code style sniffing uh, on Scrutinizer CI. You can also keep track of. Uh, uh, damn it, I forgot the name. You can keep track of 
the good coverage uh, percentage in screen CI as well. What actually happens is you're writing your code on your PC, you're pushing it to GitHub, GitHub will send a pull request to packages.org, packages.org will pick up the new version uh, or the new uh, commit hash of the of dev master or dev develop, and the test service will run the test. And then when the tests are uh, succeed or fail, it will actually change the status of the pull request or of the commit and send it to GitHub. Documentation. I already mentioned a readme.md file. I already mentioned a changelog.md file. I already mentioned a upgrade.md file. Uh, but what else should be in your readme.md file? What I like most is code samples. Something three, four lines. You can just copy and paste it. Composer required the package and then verify that the package actually does what it says it's supposed to do. So this is um, an example I got from intervention slash image. Uh, you can copy paste this and actually verify that the public slash foo.jpg file will be resized, uh, it will have a watermark, and it will be saved to a new file called public slash bar.jpg. It is that simple. If your package is super simple to use, then just give the users a super simple uh, starters guide um, inside readme.md file, just right up front of your GitHub repository. <coughs> your package should also have a license because if your package has no license, it's the worst. No one is allowed to use your code. So insert a license. It's, it's the most single, single topic uh, of this first chapter. If you don't know what license to choose, go to choosealicense.com. But if you do composer licenses, it will list all the licenses for all your dependencies. And then you will see that most of them are MIT. So you should be good with MIT. Welcome contributions. Your code is openly sourced on GitHub, so why not write a file with some instructions? How to run the tests? Uh, what? Uh, what are? Uh, if you, if people create a new method, what is uh, your philosophy of the naming? Um, how can they submit a pull request? What is supposed to go in the pull uh, in the pull request description? What is the philosophy of the package? What what kind of pull requests are allowed? which one will be closed. So, this was the first chapter. Congratulations, there are no newbies in this room anymore. Cool. Second chapter, environments. Not only your applications that you develop during your daytime jobs have environments, also packages have environments. You can have dev, or local, whatever you, you want to call it. You have testing, or test, or CI, whatever that in environment name you want. Uh, and you also have production. Your package can be in a production environment. So once you wrap your mind around this, you can actually see that it has a ton of benefits. Your package can behave differently in different environments. For example, your package has dependencies too. Or it can have dependencies, it's optional. Uh, but if those, pack if those dependencies are only needed in dev or CI, you can do composer required dash dash dev. This will add the packages to required dash dev block in composer.json, and when your package is installed by someone else, those dev dependencies will not be installed. What also is useful is uh, to do code coverage differently in dev from CI. So in my local dev environment, I want to inspect the code coverage and I want to do dash dash coverage HTML when I run PHP unit because then that will generate HTML pages which, which I can look at. But for CI environment, that's not, pretty us that's not very useful. So I want to create some kind of um, file that I can export to, uh, for example, scrutinizer CI. So in that environment, I want to run PHP unit in a different way with different options. So that's how you're supposed to 
uh, have different options in different environments. Also, um, you, have so you have some tests um, which are supposed to be run locally before you do a git push. Uh, they are supposed to run on CI, but not in other people's production. There's no, there's no use case for that. So what you want to do is keep your test out of other people's production. In, and someone installs your package, they want to have the code, whatever is in source folder, but they don't need the tests. They just simply don't need them. So how can we tackle this? If someone installs your package with the dash dash preferred dist, what Composer will do is download a zip file from GitHub um, and you can actually tweak whatever is in that zip file. It will be a zip file of, uh, which consists of all the files in your uh, GitHub repository. But with the git attributes file, you can actually change what is in that folder. You can exclude some folders there or files. Uh, like the Travis, dot, the Travis file or the make file. This is what uh, is in guzzle http slash guzzle repository. And when you do preferred dist, uh, when you install guzzle with preferred dist, you will see that in vendor folder, the guzzle http slash guzzle folder will not have a build folder, no docs, no tests. Uh, so those useless files are actually excluded. So if your tests are excluded, you should also not auto load them anymore. So that's why there's the autoload-dev block in composer.json file. So if you have some stubs to run your tests and you autoload them, put that in autoload-dev. Whatever is in there is identical or uh, behaves identically from the autoload block. So if you do PSR4 autoloading, then that will be, uh, uh, you, you can configure that in the exact same way. The next thing is global, uh, global scripts that you can install with Composer. You can do Composer require dash dash global and install PHP unit globally on your computer. I would advise against that from the moment that that uh, script or that, uh, that tool is supposed to run in CI as well. So you want to keep the versions in sync. You want to run the same PHP unit version locally to run your tests and in CI. So whatever is used in CI, don't install it globally on your computer. So dev dependencies. Those are the dependencies that are only installed in your local environment and in CI. Um, you can actually uh, add custom scripts to Composer so you can do inside composer.json file, add to the scripts block a unit test script. And uh, when you do composer unit test, like you do composer require, but with a different command, you do composer unit test, it will actually run PHP unit and whatever options you add there. It's much shorter than adding all the options every time you run compo uh, PHP unit. Um, I do this uh, so that I can use one single PHP unit .dist file or .xml file and just run unit tests differently in local environment than in CI environment. Um, note that we write PHP unit here, but Composer will first search in vendor slash bin folder for, for a PHP unit executable. And when that's not found, that then Composer will look globally on your computer. So this is pretty useful. You no longer have to write vendor slash bin. Cool. Quick recap about environments. So you have dev dependencies. It can exclude files from being installed when people do compose require preferred dist. And you can also run uh, whatever is in vendor slash bin using composer script. On to the third chapter. This is a little bit more advanced. Package stability. So you have a package, you release it, you tag it. Um, and when you have some breaking changes in the future, you will have to tag it when you follow Semver. You have to tag a new major version. 
people will um, they will not in, uh, not immediately upgrade to the new major version because it means that they will have to put in some work to um, to resolve the conflicting or the 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 breaking changes. They have to do some work to actually re uh, use your new major version. So what you want to do as a package maintainer is to hold back on new major versions. You want to be you want to have as little major versions as possible. Everyone remembers Guzzle. Guzzle had like three major versions in one year. That was a bit hard to upgrade every time. So you want to hold back on new major versions. I think Guzzle is a lot st more stable now. Uh, so that's good. Um, the problem is if you have some dependencies, uh, for example, you depend on Monolog. Oh, no, that's not a good idea because that's super stable. Uh, let's say you depend on Guzzle and Guzzle comes out with a new major version, then you will have to tag a new major version to allow people to use your package together with a new major version of Guzzle. So your package is only as stable as your dependencies. So what can we do against that? I will provide you with two tricks. Keep the number of requirements as low as possible. You don't want a ton of requirements because if any one of the required packages that you require as a package upgrades to a new major version, you will get issues from people that say, I want to use your package with the new major version of that package. Please help me. Please upgrade. And then you will be forced to release a new major version, which is stupid. So you want to keep the number of requ hard requirements as low as possible. So for that, you can do soft requirements. So imagine you have an interface, um, which is the dot, dot, dot. I don't want to invent fake interface names. But uh, you can actually add more helper classes that wrap whatever is the default implementation uh, with decorators, which is a good design pattern. Uh, for example, you have a cache decorator, which takes the PSR cache item pool as, uh, yeah, you use the PSR cache item pool to do caching. Uh, because then people can use the default implementation of whatever is in your package without the cache, uh, cache decorator, and then they don't need to require the PSR cache item pool as well as one of their dependencies. So you don't have to, this is not a high, hard requirement. If they want to use this package, you can use the suggest block in composite.json file to actually suggest using this PSR slash cache package if you want to use the cache decorator. It's not a hard requir requirement. Um, you can also move this cache decorator to a different package. For example, um, leak the fly system package from Frank de Jong did this uh, with the fly system eventable file system package. In that package, there's a simple eventable file system class, super simple. Um, so this requires leak slash file system and also leak slash event, but that's it. So if leak slash event uh, tags a new major version, then Frank only has to tag a new major version of this leak slash file system eventable file system uh, package and not have to upgrade leak slash fly system. So it's a different package and the original package stays more stable. So that's moving away dependencies to a different package. First with soft dependencies, then with a different package. So trick number two is to depend on interface packages. What are interface packages? I just made interface packages up, but this is the definition. An interface package has zero dependencies and it only consists of interfaces. Examples are PSR slash cache, PSR slash HTTP messages, uh, PSR slash log, those packages have zero re uh, requirements except for PHP greater than 5.3, which might be a little bit outdated now, but um, what is in this package is only interfaces. There's no implementations. So if you depend on that, then where are the implementations? 
Well, I'm going to introduce a new concept, or this might not be new for you, but let's introduce virtual packages as a concept. A virtual package is a high-level placeholder, I'm going to read this, is a high-level placeholder for a dependency on a more low-level implementation. So if you go to packages.org and type in psr slash cache implementation, you will see that there's a listing for this. It's a virtual, virtual package which has zero downloads and zero stars. Why is that? Because you cannot install this. This is a virtual package. It's a placeholder. People can depend on this, and then they can install whatever implementation there is that provides this. So these packages, uh, cache slash cache, for example, or cache slash hierarchical cache. Wow, this is hard to pronounce. Uh, these packages, they all provide the PSR slash cache implementation package, which is virtual. So you can actually depend on a virtual package, but you cannot install it. You can install a different package that provides this virtual package. So I'm going to put this in a nice graph. Uh, for example, you're working for an awesome company and you have an awesome uh, API. You want to provide an awesome SDK. So you're building a package called company slash SDK. When you want to provide caching for this, uh, you might want to depend on PSR slash cache implementation. Remember, you cannot install this, but you can require it. For people that install your package, they will need to choose an implementation to install as well. Company slash SDK also requires PSR slash cache because you need to type hint the cache item pool interfaces. You need to depend on that as well. So there's a couple of implementation as implementations out there. Uh, one of them is cache slash file system adapter, which provides implementations for these interfaces that are the, in the PSR slash cache package. So when you go look into the composite.json file of this package, you will see that it requires PSR slash cache. It requires leak slash fly system to actually, uh, who, who doesn't know leak slash fly system? Everyone knows, good. Um, so it provides, uh, it provides implementations of the interfaces that are in PSR slash cache using leak slash file system, fly system, sorry. And in the composite.json file, you will also see a provides block. And in this provides block, there's a link to PSR slash cache implementation. This is to tell packages.org to say, this package provides an implementation. This provides an implementation of this virtual package. So if a someone with an application wants to use your SDK, they are going to require the company slash SDK package. Composer will say, oh, wait, I can't install this because com company slash SDK requires this virtual package. I can't install this. So what you have to do is also install cache slash file system adapter or whatever implementation is out there, which will say I provide this so you can actually install company slash SDK as well. This is a quite complex graph, but note that all the arrows go upwards. This means that the most top level package, the, the, the package at the top, is the most stable of all. A virtual package is super stable. It will never have a new major version. When you go down, you see that PSR slash cache, which is the interface package, I named this, but it's not an official name. It's an interface package with zero dependencies. You can see that there's no arrows moving, uh, um, leaving this box. Um, it's super stable. It only includes interfaces, and it, don't ha it doesn't have any dependencies. Uh, and you, when you go down the graph, down to the bottom, you'll see application. Application is the most unstable package of all, because if one single box in this graph decides to release a new major version, then you will need to upgrade this in your application composite.json file. Is this clear? Good, I see a lot of heads nodding. Cool. So this dependency graph, um, 
it tells you that uh, all arrows go up. You don't depend on more low level implementations than needed. You all, all you always depend on more stable packages. Cool. So users can use whatever low level packages they want. Um, and users don't get locked into major versions. They don't get locked into, uh, let's say, Guzzle version 5. Uh, so the main thing you need to remember is that as a package maintainer, you need to prefer having less hard dependencies. You also need to prefer requiring stabler packages. The most stable packages are virtual packages. They are at the top of the graph. So there's a couple of uh, 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 number of packages that use this. Uh, we have PSR3, PSR6, and PSR7, which is logging, HTTP, and caching. Uh, and we also have uh, file system adapters uh, with fly system. So you don't dip, uh, this, so fly system is an abstraction for file, sys yeah, file operations, like reading files, writing to files. Um, but it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't depend on FTP implementations or MongoDB grid FS implementations. You get one local local adapter with fly system, but the rest of the low level implementations are not required. So you can actually, as a user, when you install fly system, you can choose your own low level implementation that you want to use with fly system. So I uh, actually learned a lot of these tricks from Matthias Novak. He's a Dutch guy, and he wrote his book called Principles of Package Design. I, I read this book. It's a, it's a big, uh, I can, how do you say this? Uh, I can genuinely uh, say that this is a great book if you want to know more about this. So I can actually go on and on and on and on about package development. Uh, so there's a lot more to learn, like uh, a semver checker, which is used to inspect your code and see uh, what is a new major, what is a new version that you should tag. Uh, you can also, uh, I can also go on and on about the carrot versus still the constraint, version constraint. Uh, I can also go on about marketing uh, and about communication, how to deal with people that send send in issues and pull requests. Um, so I just touch the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to talk about, but for now I'm going to keep it at this. Uh, so I talked about beginner steps, I talked about using environments for your package, and then I try to learn you a little bit more about stability. Thank you. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, also Afup. Um, it's a bit weird to pronounce that. You can also leave some feedback on joined in, uh, not only for me, but also for the other speakers. And you can also leave feedback on the conference itself so that the organizers can improve uh, their, uh, the conference for next year. Uh, I'll have some questions now. First questions, then lunch. So any question? Hello, thanks for the presentation. It was very, uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question about virtual package because it's very cool as a maintainer to use virtual package, yeah. but it means that it puts all the effort on the user side. Yeah. And do you have any feedback from your users? Do you use virtual package? First question. And uh, uh, second one, um, do you have any feedback from your users about, uh, I, I don't know what to do now because uh, my composer doesn't, work to, doesn't want to install virtual package. Yeah, that is a question that I get a lot. Um, and that is mainly why I talk about virtual package. So you actually know what to do when Composer says this is not installable. So I don't have any user experience feedback on that, but yeah, I want to teach people about it. So this doesn't hap happen anymore, I hope, in the future. Okay. <laughs> One more question. Hi. Um, we talk, uh, you, you talked a lot about uh, external dependencies for your packages, but um, I think um, we don't talk enough about uh, internal packages from a company, like uh, building an application and Correct. having a lot of mod modules. Yeah. Do you have exper uh, 
experience to say about that? Like, for instance, yeah. So, yeah. for internal packages, it's exactly the same, but you don't register them on packages.org. Yeah. You register them on torn proxy or something, or something something else. You can also add GitHub repositories straight into your compose.json file, and then Composer will look in the, into those repositories to find your packages. But the rest is the same. Yeah. Did, did you try something like the path repositories? Um, yeah, we used, yeah, we use that yeah. internally. You can use that for uh, if you want to reuse back, uh, pieces of code in microservices, then that's a good way to go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. If I had more time, I would talk more about that, but I only have 45 minutes. Thank you, Ennis.